The plane had been in the air for a mere 25 seconds when the pilots noticed weird noises and bizarre vibrations. They tried several ways to improve the situation, but nothing worked. The engine surges continued. And just over a minute into the flight, when the plane reached 3,000 feet, both engines failed. First the right one, two seconds later the left one. The pilots decided to return to the airport they had just left. At the same time, they tried to restart the engines. Nothing seemed to work. The flight crew made a decision to pitch the plane down and then level it off. Perhaps it could help them gain some speed for the glide. But soon, they realized they wouldn't make it to the airport. Was the plane going to crash? That's when the miracle at Gotrura occurred. The morning before the flight started as usual. Regular pre-flight procedures, good weather. The members of the flight crew were experienced pilots. A 44-year-old Danish captain with over 8,000 flight hours under his belt and a 34-year-old first officer from Sweden with 3,000 hours. So, what could go wrong? The plane itself was almost brand new. It was a McDonnell Douglas MD-81 nicknamed Dana Viking. It made its first flight on March 16, 1991. By that fateful day, the aircraft had been in service for a mere nine months. There were 122 passengers and seven crew members on board. Flight 751 Scandinavian Airlines was a scheduled flight from Stockholm, Sweden to Warsaw, Poland. On the way, the plane was supposed to make a stop in Copenhagen, Denmark. The aircraft took off from Stockholm according to its schedule at 8.47 a.m. local time. But by that point, the people inside had already been doomed, all because of a terrible sequence of events before the departure. It started the night before. The plane arrived at Stockholm Airport after a flight from Zurich. It was 10.09 p.m. The aircraft spent the night at the gate outside. It was cold. The temperature dropped to 34 degrees Fahrenheit, just above freezing. What made the situation even worse was that almost 6,000 pounds of freezing cold fuel, chilled during the night, still remained in the tanks located in the wings. The fuel was so cold because the plane had been flying at the cruising altitude, where the air temperature outside the cabin varied from minus 61 to minus 80 degrees. The flight from Zurich lasted around 1 hour and 40 minutes. Soon after midnight, a flight technician came to check on the aircraft. The man had to remove some slush from the landing gear, otherwise he wouldn't be able to examine it. At around 2 a.m., when he was leaving, he noticed some ice covering the upper part of the wings. By the morning, the situation had become even dire. A layer of clear, almost invisible ice had formed on the tops of the wings. The plane had to leave the gate at around 8.30 a.m. An hour before the departure, the mechanic responsible for the plane noticed that some ice covered the underside of the wings. He decided to make sure there was no ice on the tops of the wings. He climbed a ladder and put one knee on the wing. Then he bent forward to touch the front part of the wing. There was no ice, just some slush. The mechanic decided to make sure everything was fine with the air inlet of one of the engines. He didn't find anything abnormal. Soon after that, the personnel used more than 220 gallons of de-icing fuel to remove ice from the plane. The mechanic consulted with the captain of the aircraft and ordered the staff to de-ice the underside of the wings as well. After all, he had seen some ice there. But no one thought to double-check if there was clear ice on the tops of the wings. After they had finished the procedure, the mechanic reported to the captain, uh, We're done here. The icing finished. There was a lot of snow and ice, but everything's clear now. The captain thanked the mechanic and carried on with the pre-flight procedures. The plane taxied to the runway. Its engine's anti-ice systems were switched on and didn't show any malfunction. But several passengers later claimed they had seen ice sliding off the upper side of the wings while the plane had been taking off. And still, the plane left the ground and headed for Stockholm as usual. But shortly after the takeoff, several pieces of the overlooked ice broke off. At full speed, they slammed into the fans of the engines near the tail on both sides of the plane, ruining the blades. It led to a series of surges, and the rest is history. 
Meanwhile, somewhere in the cabin, Scandinavian Airlines flight captain Per Holmberg, who was on board as a passenger, noticed something was amiss. At first, he informed the flight attendant sitting in the rear jump seat that the right engine was surging. She tried to contact the flight crew unsuccessfully. Then, the ununiformed captain rushed to the cockpit and asked if he could help the pilots. The first officer gave him the emergency checklist, and the captain asked him to start the auxiliary power unit, a small gas turbine in the tail of the plane. Holmberg's advice and help were invaluable, but was it enough to save the plane and the people inside? When the plane emerged from the cloud cover at an altitude of 890 feet, the pilots realized they wouldn't have enough time to make it back to the airport. An immediate emergency landing was unavoidable. The assisting captain passed the order to the cabin crew, and they started preparing the passengers. There was a large field to the north of the plane, but the captain realized they didn't have enough time to reach it. So he chose a much smaller field in a forested area in the direction of flight. It was not far from the village of Gotrura in upland Sweden. The plane was just 1,300 feet above the ground when the assisting captain started extending the flaps. At a height of 183 feet, the captain reported to Stockholm Control, We're crashing to the ground! Seven seconds later, the plane hit several trees and lost a huge chunk of its right wing. By that time, the landing gear had already been extended and the speed had decreased to 139 miles per hour. Moments later, the plane's tail struck the ground and broke off. The aircraft kept sliding across the field, still at high speed. It traveled 360 feet, with its main landing gear leaving marks on the field. At one point, the plane lost the main and nose landing gear. Its fuselage broke into three parts. Miraculously, there was no fire. If you look at the pictures from the crash site, the plane torn into pieces, with its parts scattered across the field, it's hard to believe that all 129 people on board the plane survived. It seems like a miracle. But it was also thanks to the flight attendant's quick reaction and the correct instructions they gave the passengers. They didn't panic and told the people to adopt the brace position just in time to avoid fatalities. Even more surprising, almost all passengers, except for four people, made their way out of the plane on their own. No wonder this accident was nicknamed the Miracle. The aircraft, though, wasn't as lucky. The nine-month-old plane was damaged so badly that it was an immediate write-off. Everyone praised the actions of the flight crew. The landing was incredibly skilled, especially in such a fast-developing, very dangerous situation. The captain himself admitted that few pilots were ever forced to put to the test the skills they got during training at least not to this degree. He said he was proud of his crew and relieved that everyone had survived. And he never returned to piloting commercial planes. We'll start our top 10 with the smallest plane in the world, the Star Bumblebee. It was built specifically to set a world record and get this title. Its wingspan huh? is smaller than the average person's height, and the length of the plane is the same as a regular sedan. But this baby can surprise you. Its maximum speed is similar to a supercar, 190 miles per hour. Still, it has only risen in the air a few times. And it even had to make an emergency landing. But no one was injured, and the restored plane was given to a private collection. By the way, the cost of building one star bumblebee was about $10,000. So it was really a regular sedan among the planes one that could only carry one person. Next on the list is a Cessna 172. This airplane is also a record breaker. Not for its size this time, but for the number of built units. To date, more than 45,000 aircraft have been built, and it remains in production since 1956. As for its size, its length can be compared with the length of a limousine, and the wingspan is a little less than a school bus. Far fewer people can board it, though. Only the pilot plus three passengers. In 1959, this aircraft set a world record for the duration of a refueling flight. Two pilots took off at a Las Vegas airport 
and landed there in 64 days, 22 hours, and 19 minutes. Without refueling, the latest Cessna model can fly 800 miles. It's like the distance from San Francisco to Las Vegas and back. We move on to larger and more powerful aircraft, Embraer Legacy 600. It's slightly longer than a subway car, but much more comfortable. Figures. After all, it's a private aircraft worth $25 million. But if you want one, then be prepared to pay an additional $500,000 to $1 million a year just for plane maintenance. Now this plane is similar to a beluga whale in its shape. Actually, that's what it's called. Airbus A300-600ST Beluga. It's designed to carry aircraft parts and external cargo. It's also transported space shuttles. It looks like a mother airplane carrying her baby. Beluga was the one who transported the Columbus module for the ISS. Its length is like two baseball fields and almost the same wingspan. Its cargo bay is so big that it can easily accommodate the fuselage of another plane. Amazingly, it only mm -hmm. takes two people to fly such a huge machine. But despite the size of its cargo compartment, Beluga can lift no more than 47 tons, or 30 hippos, whatever they prefer on board. Its cost is about 180 million euros. It's almost like a fleet of 600 Cessnas. Boeing 787 Dreamliner. It's one of the most efficient aircraft in the world. This airplane holds the record for the longest flight without refueling. In March 2020, it flew from Papiete to Paris. The plane flew without landing for almost 16 hours and covered a distance of over 9,700 miles. This is like the distance from New York to Los Angeles four times. The cost of this big guy is estimated at $300 million. This is like 30 of the most expensive Rolls Royces or 30 million cinema tickets. Hughes H-4 Hercules. This is actually a flying boat and it was made of wood. It's the biggest flying boat ever built and it had an enormous wingspan, 321 feet. To get this thing in the air, eight propeller engines were used each with 3,000 horsepower. And even though this water monster was built in 1947, it could lift more cargo than the modern Airbus Beluga. Hercules could lift a weight of 59 tons. That's like a modern tank or about 30 SUVs. But originally, it was built to transport about 750 people at a time. Still, the payload and maximum speed of this aircraft remain an issue. This wooden guy has only made one flight in its life. It climbed to a height of about 65 feet and flew 1.2 miles above Los Angeles Harbor. Despite this, engineer Howard Hughes kept this monster in working condition for almost 30 years, spending about $1 million per year. Airbus A380. This is the largest passenger plane in the world. It has two decks and can accommodate about 850 passengers. It's like a population of a small village, all on board one airplane. To accommodate this many passengers, it has an impressive size. Its length is almost as much as a soccer field, as is its wingspan. And its height is more than a seven-story building. On top of all this, the Airbus can travel incredible distances without refueling. It can take off in Iceland, and land on the tip of South America. The only disadvantage of A380 is its price, $445 million. With this money, you can buy four private islands in the British Virgin Islands. A Saudi prince once bought one of these and modified it into a private aircraft. Now, it looks like an expensive mansion or hotel inside. It has become the largest and most expensive private jet it's estimated to cost about $500 million. Oh, and by the way, just to take off, this giant needs a runway of almost 10,000 feet. So not all airports in the world can take an Airbus A380. Scaled Composites Model 351 Stratolaunch. An unusual name for an aircraft. 
but its appearance is even more bizarre. This aircraft bears the title of the longest wingspan in aviation history of all time, 385 feet. This is more than the length of a soccer field, plus a limousine. The pilot, co-pilot, and flight engineer are in the right fuselage cockpit. The cockpit of the left fuselage is used as a storage unit. Six powerful engines help this giant take off, and eight racks with a total number of 28 wheels help the big guy to land. Stratolaunch was designed to launch Pegasus rockets from it, but now it's going to be used to launch hypersonic flights. Well, whatever its purpose, pilots will have to be careful because so far there's only one Stratolaunch Model 351 in the world. Jumbo Jet or Boeing 747. This is the world's first long-haul double-deck aircraft. This baby held the title of the heaviest and most capacious aircraft for 36 years until Airbus A380 appeared. Its wingspan is more than the length of a hockey field, and its length is 250 feet, which is equal to the height of 15 giraffes. This aircraft set a record for the number of passengers on one flight. During a rescue operation in Ethiopia, there were 1,086 people on board the 747. This plane was also used to transport the President of the United States, or his First Lady. In this case, the aircraft was assigned a call sign Air Force One or Air Force One Foxtrot. And the cargo version of this plane was used for transportation of the space shuttle from reserve airfields to the place of its launch at Cape Canaveral. Antonov AN-225 Maria is the heaviest aircraft ever built. It also has the largest wingspan of any aircraft in operational service. The distance between the tips of its wings is almost like the length of a soccer field, and its body length is 275 feet. This is like six school buses in a row. Naturally, it's a power lifter among planes. In 2009, Antonov was listed in the Guinness Book of Records for lifting the heaviest monocargo in aviation history, 187 tons. That's like 1,000 of the smallest aircraft in the world, the Star Bumblebee, or four Boeing 737s. But the absolute record for Antonov's lifting capacity is 253 tons. This is like half the tallest building in the world, the Burj Khalifa. Well, the records of this aircraft are quite long, since its first flight, the AN-225 has set 240 world records. This is a unique case in aviation and is, in fact, a record itself. This thing is not exactly an airplane, but it deserves a place on our list. The Caspian Sea Monster. It was an experimental wing ship. That means it used air force reflected from the surface of the earth or water to stay in the air. Formally, it was a ship, as it could fly at an altitude of only a few meters. But it looked more like an amphibian, and only pilots could fly it. A pretty complicated system, right? For a long time, it was the heaviest plane in the world. When it was empty, it weighed 240 tons. That's like 60 elephants. And it took 10 engines to get this thing in the air, five on each side but it still had enough speed to get from New York to Washington in half an hour. So, it's pouring outside when you get on a plane. If you were in a car, you'd simply switch on the windshield wipers and the headlights after turning the key in the ignition. Do pilots do that? Airplanes spark so many questions, and it's time for some answers. Do planes have windshield wipers? Yes, commercial planes do, but they're only used during taxiing, takeoff, and landing. Once a plane reaches its cruising altitude, pilots turn them off. The plane's speed is fast enough to clear the windshields from rain. Wipers might be absent on single-engine airplanes because the propeller airstream blows strong enough to keep the water away. What happens when a plane loses one engine in flight? Actually, it goes, hey, has anybody seen my engine? It was just here a second ago. No, nothing special. The plane actually just keeps flying. There are certificates for planes flying over oceans or long distances that state how long they can do it. For example, 
the Boeing 787 can fly for more than 5 hours without the second engine. It's enough for pilots to plan a safe landing. Well, why is it so cold on a plane? The temperature on board averages 74 degrees Fahrenheit, about the same as in most office buildings. But you feel so cold because your body doesn't move much, producing less heat to warm itself. The crew doesn't turn the heat up because hot air can cause some passengers to faint during the flight. Do airplanes have horns? Yeah, and some of them have a whole trumpet section. Actually, yes, they do have horns, but pilots don't use it to scare away birds or get other aircraft's attention in the sky. Hey, move over, buddy! Actually, you can hear that high-pitched chime only on the ground when the plane isn't moving. Like when an engineer checks something in the cockpit and wants to get the attention of a ground crew member. Why do planes leave white trails in the sky? It happens when the engine burns fuel. It ejects water and carbon dioxide that gets mixed with the atmosphere. And since the air is cold at high altitude and this exhaust is hot, the water condenses and may freeze, creating those white tails. Do airplanes have brakes? Yes, there are multiple disc brakes made of carbon steel material similar to the ones in your car. But using them only isn't enough to stop the plane when it touches the ground. The braking system also includes different surfaces that slide out of the wings and disrupt the airflow. Can a plane door open mid-flight? The cabin pressure is the force that won't let that happen. If someone tried to do it, they would have to overcome more than 24,000 pounds of pressure, the weight of a ship anchor. Plus, there are lock bolts deep inside the aircraft's structure that hold the door in place. What happens when lightning hits a plane? Now, statistics say this happens to every commercial plane about once a year. But the aircraft's metal parts and lightning protection systems prevent electrical buildup. So, in most cases, this leaves a plane with only a scorch mark on its surface. Why don't the seats and windows always line up? Good question! All commercial planes are designed with seats and windows perfectly aligned. But when an airline buys a jet, it often chooses to add extra seats. More seats mean more passengers and more tickets sold. And less of a view and less legroom for you. See how that works? Why do flight attendants touch the overhead compartment? You'd think that they're checking to see if it's closed tightly. But nope, they use a scalloped handrail hidden at the bottom of the overhead compartment for a steadier walk along the aisle. What are those white spiral marks on engines for? Well, since the ground staff wear hearing protection, they can't rely on their ears to decide if it's safe to approach the plane. Seeing that moving swirl on jet engines prompts them to stay away from the area. Why are there holes in airplane windows? Those windows actually have three panes of plexiglass. The tiny hole is in the middle one. It helps regulate the huge pressure difference inside and outside the cabin, so the outer pane can handle the load. If the outer pane happened to break, the middle one, even with a hole in it, would still be enough to keep the window intact. That hole also keeps the windows from fogging up. Why are there hooks on the wings? If there is an emergency landing on water, passengers have to step on the slippery wings to use some emergency exits. That's why crew members secure one end of a rope to the door frame and the other to the wing through the hook. Another rope is secured in the second hole, safely leading passengers along the wing to the inflatable slide. Why do the wings have different colored lights? It's for Christmas. Now, that red light on the left wing tip, the green one on the right, and the white one on the tail make up the plane's navigational lights. They let other pilots know the plane's position and the direction it's moving in, toward them or away. Do planes have ignition keys? Well, since ignition keys are usually a security measure, most commercial planes don't need them. They're locked in hangars under 24-7 surveillance. To start the engine, a pilot just pushes buttons and turns switches. But smaller private planes, like a Cessna, have ignition keys to start the engine and even locks on the doors. Why are there triangles above the windows? These black and sometimes red stickers let the crew know which window is best to look out when they want to check the moving parts of the wing. If you get motion sickness during the flight, 
try to choose a seat between the triangles for a more comfortable trip. How can you get extra space on a plane? Well, if you're lucky enough to get an aisle seat, there's a magic button near the hinge under the armrest closest to the aisle. Press it, and the armrest will swing up to the back of your seat. Why are most planes white? Well, this color reflects the sun better than any other, so it helps keep a plane cool. It's also much easier to spot any cracks, dents, leaks, and other faults on the white surface. And paint makes a plane 1,200 pounds heavier, causing it to burn more fuel. Airlines save money by not painting them. Why don't airplanes have parachutes for passengers? Well, like paint, parachutes would also add extra weight, around 8,000 pounds. Plus, skydivers must go through at least 4 hours of training to learn how to handle a parachute. Lastly, jumping out of a plane at 35,000 feet in the air is simply not safe, because temperatures at that altitude are colder than the Arctic, minus 65 degrees. Why can't planes fly when it's hot? Well, the molecules in hot air are much more spread out. To lift a plane, you need dense air. That's why it gets harder for a plane to take off as the temperature increases. Besides, scorching weather can overheat the internal machinery or even melt some of its parts. So, if it gets 104 degrees Fahrenheit outside, your flight might be delayed. Why do planes have round windows? The very first commercial planes had square ones. But after some time, they started flying at a higher altitude that demanded the cabin be pressurized. Frequent pressurization and depressurization deformed and even broke windows with corners. They were replaced with round ones, since they withstand the pressure much better. How do the oxygen masks work? Very well, actually. If the cabin is depressurized at cruising altitude, it loses oxygen. The masks provide that, but only for 15 minutes. It's okay, though. That's long enough for the pilot to descend lower than 10,000 feet, where the air has more oxygen and people can breathe normally. What causes turbulence? Your trip gets bumpy because of three main reasons – storms, mountains, and jet streams. Just like an ocean, air creates waves when it meets a mountain. And sometimes it has nowhere to go but up in strong currents affecting a plane. Jet streams are bands of swift winds that appear when warm air masses collide with cold ones. Storm clouds push air away, creating unpredictable waves. Why do planes sometimes dump fuel? If there's an emergency landing, pilots must quickly get rid of excess weight, since they didn't burn it, and get to the destination runway as light as they should be. The lighter the plane, the softer it'll touch the ground, so no blown tires or fire. Why are the doors on the left side? Well, the captain usually sits on that side, so aligning the plane with the terminal jet bridge is easier. They fuel the aircraft and load baggage on the right side. If passengers are coming in on the left, it doesn't disturb those crews. Why do they dim the lights during takeoff and landing? It takes your eyes up to 30 minutes to fully adjust to a dark setting. Dimming the lights at night or dusk prepares them in case passengers need to make an emergency exit. They fade the lights during the day to save some engine power. Why are most plane seats blue? This color is psychologically associated with safety and reliability, so flight-weary passengers feel less anxious. Besides, stains and dirt are less visible on blue seats. Now we know!